Good morning, everybody. Um, those who are online were going like, what is going on? And it's like, wow, you guys are way back there. So, sorry. I did shower. So, anyway, let's stand, and we're going to begin our worship with a declaration that I hope all of you can say from the depth of your heart is how great it is to be in this place today. So let's sing. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty, for my soul longs and even I don't know if you know this or not, but you just sang some verses of scripture. And in Psalm 84, it says this, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. And in the 10th verse, it says, Better is one day in your courts than a thousands elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. That psalm is going to be the focus of our worship service today. As we just Hopefully that is a bold proclamation you can make. That it's like, it is good to be in this place. This is the best place for us to be on a Sunday morning. This is the best place, our best thing for us to do 
on a Sunday morning. And part of the reason why it is the best place for us to be is because we get the opportunity to gather in the presence of God and just say, God, you are so good. And so let's just sing this song about the goodness of God, that he is so good. And his love is so amazing. His grace and mercy are so awesome. And so let's just sing this song. Amazing love that welcomes me, the kindness of mercy. Bought with blood, wholeheartedly, my soul undeserving. God, you're so good. God, you're so Father God, we are so thankful that we are in the best place that we can be today. We're in your presence. We are in this opportunity, in this time that we have set aside in our lives to just say, God, you're good. And even though we walk through valleys of shadows, 
of death and sickness, even though we walk through shadows of just discouragement, that you are there with us. Your presence is constantly there. Father, I thank you for uh, giving this opportunity today. Father, indeed, help us to just know that we have gathered today to worship you. And in gathering today, you give us strength, the strength to just face another day, to face another week, to face another uh, situation we're going to face. But Father, you give us strength. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. We're going to dismiss our kids for mustard seeds at this time. And, and as they are, are uh, getting to read, j- just want to take a, a moment to kind of make an announcement uh, about the m- next month and what's going to happen next month. The first of next month, Augie is going to have a major surgery. Um, and it's going to basically take him out of commission for an entire month. And so... Now, the good thing is, the way God works this out, and he, it, because God coordinates our schedule sometimes better than us, it's like we get to have our first junior high youth group, we get to have our first fifth quarter, we get to have our first senior high youth group, and we get to have our first uh, rock youth group. And the day after that, Augie has surgery. <laughs> and so, so anyway, we kind of get the year kicked off, and then Augie's going to have surgery. And I just want to just ask that you will just um, keep Augie in your prayers as he goes into this surgery. He's going to be on very limited duty uh, for the month of September. But he, j- he put together a short little video to just kind of fill you in on what he and his family is asking of you. So will you watch this video? Hey, Central. So this is a health update for me. So uh, for those of you who don't know, I do not have a COVID. But they did put what is called a J pouch in. Uh, over the last 10 years or so, that J pouch has started to have issues. Uh, and now we're at the point where that J pouch no longer is functioning in a way that is healthy for my body. So on September 2nd, 7 30 a.m. Central Time, I am having a surgery where they're going to remove that J pouch and some other things and give me an ileostomy. I know that's a lot of information and maybe even some TMI in there. Uh, this is something that the church leadership and Tony and myself talked about a few times, uh, and, and the best way of conveying this to you guys, and we feel this video is best. Now, with that surgery, I will be out uh, approximately a month, um, basically non-existent for a month. This is uh, mostly to recover, but there's some other things that I have to relearn and some things that I have to be able to do, and so there's some things there as well. Uh, what we ask as a family is simply this. Uh, we know that guys are a very generous and loving family, but with the changes coming with this, there's going to be a lot of uh, dietary changes that we're uh, asking that you do not bring us food. We, we love that your generosity is there, and we think that you guys are a great and generous church, and we are grateful for that. But until we get the kind of dietary things figured out in the house, we need to make sure that we are controlling that as best as we can. There's things you can do, first of all, you guys can pray for us. Uh, this would be stressful for my life, stressful for me, stressful for my kids, uh, and we would really be uh, not smart if we were not to ask for this stuff. Uh, but if you guys wanted to do something during that time, uh, basically I'll be in the hospital for about a week, and then after that I'll come home. If you guys wanted to take the kids out, uh, even just to take them to Walmart back, or take them to a restaurant back, or you know, just take them off my hands for a couple hours, I know the kids would probably really like that as well as my wife would really appreciate that as well. Uh, one of the last things we just gotta tell you is we are so grateful to uh, surf alongside you. We are so, so blessed by you guys and we want you guys to know that Jesus loves you guys all uh, very much. As we uh, get re- he prepares, as their family continues to uh, make adjustments, um, as our church family makes adjustments. Let, let's just take a moment to just pray for Augie and Caitlin as uh, they anticipate this. Father, I just thank you uh, for Augie and his ministry here with us. And Lord, this surgery has been weighing on his head and his heart for a long time, knowing it's kind of coming and now the time is here. And so I just pray, Lord, that you'll just continue to give uh, to the medical staff the wisdom they need. You give to our church leadership the wisdom we need as we just kind of work through this fall and how this all looks as we 
just are able to get things going again. Um, Father, none of that's a surprise to you. And so, Father, we are trusting you. you are, we are looking to you, seeking you for your, your wisdom, for your guidance. I pray for uh, just strength for Augie as he, uh, in the time from now till the surgery, we pray for healing uh, in the time afterwards. I pray for Caitlin and uh, this, the adjustments um, she will ma- have, has made and will continue to make just to be give care. Thank you for this couple. Thank you for their family and just the part of ministry they are with us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So if you, j- we'll, we'll keep you posted on how he's doing and things like that. Um, so anyway, I, I came across an article this week that kind of chuckled me. Um, I was looking at how does a town come up with a slogan? So I was just Google searching town slogans. And this guy wrote this article about 77 terrific town slogans, and he says the Why Not 100 it was his blog post, anything literary. And so, so anyway, he has this, I, I think it's funny because he has the top 100, but he has 77 terrific town slogans. And as I was looking for it, the reason the article caught my eye is because Rockwell City, Iowa, is on his list. Those of you who don't know, that's where our son Dylan ministers. And so I instantly had to send Dylan. I copied the link and said, hey, you made the list, Rockwell City, Iowa. Well, here's Rockwell City, Iowa's town slogan. It's the golden buckle on the corn belt. As you drive into Rockwell City, there's a big sign that says that, the, the golden buckle on the corn belt. And so this guy's article is just, it's hilarious because he says this. How often is it that you rumble along a rural highway, casually turn your eyes to a billboard on the side of the road, and burst out laughing? Well, the answer is more often than you might think. A good number of rural hiccups have learned not to take themselves too seriously when attempting to make their mark on the memoirs of, of a passerby, they've discovered that self-deprecation often does the trick. And so here's the ta- challenge. How, uh, how does a town forge its identity? At its essence, that the question facing the to- town folks as they settle on a town slogan. How do you describe yourself? But I love what he says next. How do we make our mark especially to an audience that is driving by at 60 mile an hour. So get it? It's like, how do you make your determination? And so what I find interesting, of his 77, 10 towns in Iowa are on his list. So apparently we Iowans have some really good slogans. One of them is fairly close to us. It's in Cass County. Anita, a whale of a town. I'm still trying to figure out that one. How did they get that, that one? Melbourne, Iowa, right on top, not down under. Gravity, Iowa, we're down to earth. Jewel, Iowa, a gym in a friendly setting. It's good. Beeman, Iowa. You're not dreaming, you're in beaming. <laughs> Brit, Iowa, founded by rail, sustained by plow. I don't quite get it, but I lived close to Brit when we served in Goldfield. And I was like, that's the plow that you till the ground or the snow plow. Because here's what happened every fall. We had a family who attended church. They were in Brit. And when, when they would come to church to say, it snowed today, and we could honestly put on the calendar, in three weeks, it's going to snow here. They were just far enough north, the snow line would move south. So three weeks before it would snow in Goldfield, it had already snowed in, in, in Brit. So sustained by the plow, yeah, it was probably the snow plow. Riverside, Iowa. I had to look this one up because, like, it's town slogan is this. Where the trek begins. Where the trek begins. Star Trek. Okay? We've seen the marker. Yeah. And it actually has a 
marker that is the future home of Captain James P. Kirk. I'm like, the future home? So I don't get it. So here's the story. A few years ago when the city was having their centennial, one of the town council members got this idea. It's like, hey, we need to get a hold of the author of the guy who wrote the Star Trek series because apparently Captain James T. Cook or James T. What's his name? Kirk. James T. Kirk. I knew that was wrong when I said it. James T. Kirk was born in rural Iowa in his novels. And so the town petitioned the author that said, we want to be that town. And the author agreed. And so now the town of Riverside, Iowa, is the town where the trek begins. Whitmore, Iowa, cares more, shares more. And my favorite, probably of all, is, uh, did I, where did I find it? Redland, Iowa. 857 friendly people and one old grump. <laughs> Apparently, they still have old grump days. I don't know who gets nominated, but they are a town with an old grump. <laughs> slogans are really good because in, in a way it just describes is how do we identify ourselves and I think if there was a slogan that I could come up with and this is the kind of the reason for the title of the message today the psalm we're going to look at I think the slogan is this this is a great place to be this is a great place to be we are going to look at Psalm 8 and I hope you have your Bible with you because uh, I, this is probably one of my favorite psalms in just what it says. We sang a song. We began our worship service singing this song and looking at these verses. Verse 1, how lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. Verse 10, better is one day in your courts than a thousands elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. I think if you were to put a slogan on this chapter of Psalm, it would say, this is a great place to be. So how do we look at that? I want us to just consider a little bit about this psalm because there's a lot of neat things in it. And it begins with even the title of the psalm. You got your Bible and you're looking, and it says this at the very beginning. For the director of music, according to the getith of the sons of Korah, a psalm. So it's a song that was written for a very specific purpose. And the sons of Korah wrote this psalm. It's a psalm of pilgrimage. It's probably a song that the people of Israel sang as they made their way to Jerusalem for one of the obligatory feasts that they had. And so it's just like, so they wrote this psalm. It says, according to the getith. I love footnotes because it's like, getith is probably a musical term of uncertain what it is. Okay? So we don't know what it is. According to the getith. There's another word that appears in some translations. It's not in the NIV, but after verse 4 and after verse uh, where's my notes? Verse 8 is the word Selah. Selah. Again, another unknown musical term. But actually, if you read through some of the older translations, you see it. It's a break. It's like there's this stanza, and then it says Selah. And I kind of get the impression a little bit. It's just like, I said something, now pause. Mull that over for a little bit. And in this psalm, the sons of Korah are telling us, here's a praise, here's a song to sing. And there's some things we just need to stop and ponder in it a little bit. There's another thing of significance in this title, the sons of Korah. If you look at First Chronicles, this 26th chapter, you see that the, the Levites, all, it's one of those sections of Scripture going, why do I have to read all these names? I don't get it. Well, it, it describes the sons of Korah. The Korahites were gatekeepers. 
their job was to guard the gate of the temple. And so when you see better is a thousand, I, you know, better is one day in your courts and a thousand days elsewhere, he said, I would rather be a doorkeeper, a gatekeeper in the house than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. There's significance in all these little things of this psalm. So let's just read through this psalm because it's a neat, neat psalm. And I hope that out of it we understand that this is a good place to be. In this room today, taking this time on a Sunday morning, this is a good place to be. Here's what the sons of Korah write. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and a swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young. A place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. It's an amazing psalm where the sons of Korah describe to us a great place to be. This psalm is a psalm of pilgrimage, it's said. And we see in the scripture that three times a year the Jewish Go to Jerusalem. Deuteronomy 16, 16 says this. Three times a year all your men must appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose. At the festival of unleavened bread, the festival of weeks, and the festival of tabernacles. No one should appear before the Lord empty handed. So the people of Israel had these songs. The sons of Korah wrote this song, and it's probably one that when they're traveling to to Jerusalem, they sing this song. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord, O God Almighty. But I want us to see something in this psalm. Three times in this psalm, there's a blessing pronounced. There's three blessings. And if you remember, when we started this series of the, the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms itself starts with a blessing. And over and over, blessings are pronounced throughout the book of Psalms. And in this one chapter, there are three blessings. Let's look back to Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. It says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but those who delight in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That's part of the reason why we're doing this series. There's a promised blessing if we would just spend time studying, reading, praising, praying through the Psalms. There's a blessing that comes to it. But the sons of Korah remind us of some blessings we have from being in this place. Notice verse 4, it says, Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. This is part of the reason why I say I think this is a great place for us to be. Why is this a great place to, for us to be? Is because I think it's in this place we get to enter into the presence of God. I say that cautioning, though. This is not the only place that we can enter into the presence of God. But it is a good place to be when we find ourselves entering into the presence of God. 
And for the Jewish people, it was being able to go to Jerusalem, to go to the temple and to praise God there. Even though it was ob an obligation for them to go three times a year, there was a joy, there was a blessing they felt and received from being in that place and going to that place. I hope and pray, and this has been my hope and prayer for our church family, that each one of you who are here today, you've taken the time, you said, no, this is the best place for me to be right now at this time. This is the blessed, best place to be. And because we've done that, we will sense a blessing. The sons of Korah said, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. But there's something else that's really beautiful in these first four verses. He says this in verse 3, Even the sparrow has found a home, and a swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young. A place near the altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Earlier this summer, I did one of our devotions out here in the front, hoping that one of those swallows would have just dive-bombed me in the midst of it. But it didn't. We freaked it out, and it flew away. But I don't know if you've noticed that there's a barn swallow nest out here by the front door. And it reminds me of this song, that even the swallow has found a place. Even the sparrow has a place. One commentator said it this way about the sparrow and the swallow. The sparrow, if you can recall the words of Jesus, he said, are you not worth more than two sparrows? You know, they are worth only a penny. See, the sparrow represented the things that a lot of times, and the Jewish people considered worthless. Worthless, of no value. And Jesus says, we are worth more than even a sparrow. Because even the sparrow, God notices. And on the other hand is the swallow. The swallow represents all that is just flighty. It's all that is not calm. It's all that is just chaotic. If you watch a swallow, they are not a calm bird. Like I say, it's, it norm, normally if there's a nest nearby, they're going to like come after you. They're not going to sit still. And the commentator said this, the swallow, all those who may feel worthless, or those who feel like their life is nothing but chaos, God has a place. That in this place, it's a welcome place. No matter where we are or what we're dealing with, this is a great place to be. You are in a welcome place. And blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. And then there's the sale. Pause and let that just... Can you make the bold proclamation? This is a good place to be. The sons of Korah go on and say there's another blessing. Verse 5 says, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. There's a blessing for those of us who find our strength in God. I find this really beautiful, the description that, that the sons of Korah describe in this verse. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage, as they pass through the valley of Baca, They make it a place of spring. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. The exact location of a valley of Baca is really unknown. But there is a place for a lot of people to make their trek to Jerusalem. There is this valley that is a valley of willows. And a willow tree looks like it's weeping. Baca means to weep. As we pass through the valley of Baca, the place of we weeping, and sometimes I think there's a description for us that we need to capture. Blessed are those who find strength in the Lord. Even though we may go through a valley of weeping, even though we may go through a sorrowful time, a sorrowful place, this 
is a good place to be. Because when we put ourselves in the presence of God, there is a strength that comes to us. Another commentator then kind of went on. As you look at the next verse, it says this, they went, they go from strength to strength till each appeared before the Lord. Think of it this way. They go from strength to a strength. They go from a Sunday morning, they go from a time of worship and fellowship to a time of worship and fellowship, from strength to strength. But what's here in the middle? So many times our life are like the valley of Baca, of weeping, of sorrow, of sickness, of illness, of frustrations. There's just life just is not good at times. But yet there's a blessing for those who find their strength in God. Because when we gather together, there's a strength that comes upon us. There's an encouragement that comes upon us. And so we can go from one week of gathering great strength, go through the valley of Baca, and come to another week, weekend of strength. We go from strength to strength. It's a beautiful psalm in what it is describing for us. And there's a promise of a blessing. Blessed are those whose strength is in you. And then the, then the sons of Korah says this, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. I, again, so many encouraging words came to me from, from so many different commentators. And one said this, do we understand what the psalmist is saying? The slightest contact with God through we real, heartfelt worship is far more satisfying than the deepest involvement in sin. The sinful life is always promising satisfaction, and the deeper one goes into it, the less satisfaction he finds. But the deeper one goes into public worship, the more satisfaction he finds. And so better is one day here than a thousands elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper here. I would rather be on the, even the closest outskirts where I can only partially hear what's going on than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. This is a great place to be. And the sons of Korah end with one more blessing. Verse 12 says this, Blessed are those, Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Now, I'm a preacher, and it's real easy for people to say, well, yeah, you're paid to go to church. It's true. No, I'm paid so I can. I am here, and it e might be easy for me to say, man, this is a great place to be, but from the depths of my heart, truly, this is is a great place to be. And the reason I have found the truth of what the psalmist is saying in Psalm 84 is because of this promised blessing. It starts with us trusting God. It starts with us yielding our lives to Him. You know, for some people, it may not make a lot of sense. Why do you make the trek to Jerusalem? Why do you go to church every week? because I have learned to trust in God. And there's a blessing that comes when I take time to worship and praise with one others. There's a blessing that comes. There's a strength that comes when I take time to worship with others. But it has been my trust in God that has allowed me to get to that point and to see that point. I'm trusting in God. The question that we have, are you trusting God? Have you trusted Him with your life? Are you yielding control of your life over to Him? Because when we yield our control of our life over to Him, when we trust Him and we take time to Him, we go from strength through the valley of Bacah to strength. There's a blessing 
for when we trust in him. And trusting in him means giving our life to him and saying, God, you're in control. I look to you. I travel to be with you. I worship you. And there's a blessing because in your presence is the best place to be. Father God, we thank you for giving us this time today. And there's probably a hundred different places we could have been this morning. But Father, I thank you for this church family who has taken this time, said, no, today, this time, this is the place for us to be. Father, thanks for the encouragement we get from you. Thanks for the encouragement we get from one another. As we praise you, as we worship you, as we declare our trust in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. We're going to sing a song of response, and I'm just going to ask if you just stand. You've been sitting a while. But let's go ahead and stand and just sing this song. And if there is a way that you feel like God is stirring in your heart, that I need to declare my trust, my faith in him, I want to give my life to Christ, I want to talk to you afterwards. Or you can catch Augie or one of the elders that normally hang out at the back during this portion of our worship service. But just what does it mean to trust you? God is a good God. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. But his goodness means his love, his mercy, forgiveness, and his grace. And so let's just sing of the goodness of God. And I lay my life and trust you. Let's sing.
All my life you have been so, so good with every breath that I am able. I will sing of the goodness of God all my life. All my life you have been faithful. All my you have been so, so good with every breath that I am able. I will sing of the goodness of God, and I will sing of the goodness. Good morning. Well, I forgot my hearing aid, so I'll try to speak up so you can hear me. Okay? Anyway, uh, I'd like to read from Isaiah chapter 54, verse 20, English Standard Version. Assemble yourself and come draw near together, you survivors of the nations. They have no knowledge who carry out their wooden idols and keep praying to a God that cannot save. I imagine, what, probably 20, 30, 50 verses on idols. And I can read all of those or I could tell you a story. So <laughs> what do you think, Jim? Story? OK. <laughs> 10 years or so ago, my family was in Colorado, and we went to Denver to visit the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. We went to see a visiting or traveling exhibit about Pompeii and Herculaneum and their downfall after the eruption of Vesuvius, Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD. There are many fascinating things there that was preserved uh, after the uh, eruption. There were, um, after the exact uh, dug up, Bread, tools, pots, and just all kinds of everyday things. It's just good condition. It's fascinating. But what sticks in my mind the most was a small group of Roman household gods. There was wood, I think a little bigger than Barbie size, maybe a little bigger, carved out of wood. And I guess the households had these to pray to. But I was just thinking, golly, during the eruption, they probably thought the world was coming to an end. And this Roman probably prayed to these wooden gods. And guess what? It didn't help. It didn't help at all because their gods didn't exist. The Roman gods of Mars, Juno, Apollo, Vulcan, Minerva, and other false gods and idols through the centuries were all invented and will not aid us, not help us at all. As Christians, we worship a living God and our prayers are heard. Through Jesus, that we're about to, we worship by recalling his death on the cross to cover our sins and save our souls. We worship him through baptism, songs, prayers, witnessing, reading his word, and the communion ceremony that we're about to have. He alone is worthy of our praise and worship. Shall we join together in prayer? Lord Jesus, we give you praise this morning because we know that through your sacrifice, our prayers are heard. We remember you by taking of the loaf and the cup as you asked us to do. Thank you for being the one true God for us. And it is his name we do prayer. Pray, amen. Guys are going to serve communion, and in the tray is a stack of cups. Bread is underneath the juice. If you want to just take it quickly, you can. And otherwise, if you want to just pull it out, hold it, and take it any time that you feel you want to take communion during this song, that would be great. There's.
still a table at the back. If you would like not to touch the tray, that's fine. You can just get up and grab one of the, the ones at the back.
I hope that indeed today has been the day that you could boldly proclaim this is a great place to be. There's a lot of things happening and coming up. I hope you ch take a bulletin home with you. Uh, be in prayer for our youth group start. It's coming right around the corner. School is right around the corner. One thing you may have noticed for the, ba the last month is, is a, we've been announcing Generation Day. Uh, on September 12th uh, is the day before Grandparents Day. And, you know, it's a joy being a grandparent, but I know not everybody's a grandparent. But anyway, it's like, but one of the great things I think as a grandparent, it's really fun to do is get everybody together. And so that's the idea of Generation Day, is that we can get as many people, we have a long history, a long cherished legacy within this church, and so we want to encourage you to get your family together, and be, let's worship together, especially on September 12th. Another thing uh, that we want to do on that day is we want to just make an addition to our wall next to the, next to the nursery. How many of you in this room was a baby? <laughs> Everybody was a baby. You don't remember? Uh, no, some of you is too long ago or whatever. But, but anyway, what we're asking is if you have a baby picture, if you can find it, find that old black and white, because some of you, that's all there was um, when you were a baby, was a black and white. We want to make a copy of it. We're going to make a mural. And then we're going to have a little bit of a contest to see who can pick and name the most. You know, so maybe some of you still look like you did as a baby. There's others that, nope, not going to happen. But anyway, we do need everybody's help with this. Could, if you could get us a baby picture, that would be awesome because we're going to have some fun on Generation Day and the, and the few weeks after that as well. And so good things happening. This is a good place to be. Let's stand. I want to close with prayer, and then we're going to sing a song of just continued praise. There is a blessing for those who trust in the Lord. There's a blessing of being in this place. There's a blessing of going from strength to strength. And those who find their strength in him are ever praising him. And so hopefully throughout this week, you will ever praise your God. Let's pray. Father, thanks so much for allowing us to be in this place today, to worship and to praise your name. And we could sing of your love forever and ever. And there will be a day when we do that. And, uh, Father, it's not something we uh, look with dread. I hope that it's something we look forward to with amazing anticipation when we can sing and we can praise and we can just worship and see the almighty king the lord of lords and we can praise his name it's in your, it's in jesus name we pray now the mountains and the sea your river runs with love for me and i will open up my heart and let the healer set me free i'm happy to be in the truth and i Sing of when.
of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I noticed not many of us were dancing. But you know what? This last Wednesday night, there was a party in heaven because we had a young man who uh, his mom called me and said, hey, he wants to get baptized. He just kind of brought it up last night. Anyway, he came over to our house, and as we were talking, he said, why can't I do it just now? And so the Ethiopian eunuch said, here's water. Why can't I be baptized? So last Wednesday, little Trent Sunderman, was baptized in the Christ for the forgiveness of his sin. He's sitting there, woo He's like, I don't want to do it in front of a bunch of people, so why can't I just do it now? And I said, go for it. Let's do this. So anyway, there's a party. I feel like dancing. I could sing of his love. Have a great day. It's a great week. See you later.